Obesity rates have not improved for many years in Queensland, in Australia and globally. In Queensland, two in three adults and one in four Queensland kids are living with overweight or obesity. It's costing the healthcare system over $750 million a year. There's no quick fix. It's an intractable problem with diverse causes requiring complex solutions. Some of these span environmental, genetic, economic and geographical. We need to act and quickly. We need to nudge behaviours to support Queenslanders adopt and maintain a healthy lifestyle. Currently less than 6% of children and 7% of adults are reaching daily recommendations for veg intake. Fewer than 48,000 children are getting their recommended one hour of physical exercise each day. Up to 45% of Queensland adults are experiencing poor sleep health. It's important to understand why. Health and Wellbeing Queensland is working hard to drive generational change through a strong focus on equity, obesity prevention, food security and clinical prevention, working towards better health for all Queenslanders. We're working relentlessly with partners, the community, the system and individuals, connecting in an impactful way to create change for everyone. Prevention is the key. Its efficacy is undisputed. Now is the right time and for the right purpose. There couldn't be a better time to reset, reframe and refocus on our health and the prevention of chronic disease. Generation Queensland is the vision. Health and Wellbeing Queensland is the driver. Together, we will lead change that benefits all Queenslanders. Yes, round of applause, isn't it? It's wonderful to see those little faces, isn't it? But uh, not, not nice to hear those stats. So that's what we're here for today. Good morning, I'm Loretta Ryan from ABC Radio Brisbane. It is a pleasure to be here uh, for the inaugural Health and Wellbeing Symposia. I'd like to start by asking you to stand, please, for the arrival of the Governor of Queensland, Her Excellency, the Honourable Dr Jeanette Young. We are all here to celebrate what has been achieved over the last three years. Since 2019, when Health and Wellbeing Queensland was established as the first public health agency in Queensland. And it is an opportunity to formally acknowledge and thank Health and Wellbeing's partners, many of whom are here today, and they have been an integral part of this journey of helping reduce overweight and obesity, chronic disease, health inequities for all Queenslanders. I'd ask you all to take a seat now, thank you. Now, during today, you are going to hear from several acclaimed professionals. They'll have some wonderful things that you will really uh, be interested to hear about. They're all dedicated, they're passionate in identifying how we can best help people live healthier and better lives, and that's what we're all about here today. Our program is available digitally as well, and we've opted for a sustainable approach. That's very important. So there are no printed copies available. You can find the QR codes to access the program on the screen now. Yep, <laughs> or the direct link in your event confirmation email, so do remember that. On to the practical information we always have to do when we go out and about, uh, housekeeping. You will find the bathrooms, if you haven't found them already, located uh, near the box office on the lower minstrel gallery and the main foyer level. And in case of, emer of an emergency, of course, follow the directions always of the QPAC staff. And finally, I really want you to join the conversation today. So if you do have a question for our panellists uh, while they're up speaking, we do have time for that. So have a think about what they're saying. And if there's anything that you'd like to add or to ask them, we'd really love you to take part. That's what we're here for today. And also tag us on social media. That hashtag is HWQLD Symposia 2022. So please do that as well. And a very special welcome also to those guests joining us online. It's great that we have so many across Australia today joining us uh, on the live stream. So um, thank you for making your time today. And uh, you can also join in the Q&A as well on that live stream and ask questions of the speakers. Um, a gentle reminder though that the Q&A function is public and uh, we will, it will be seen by everyone online. So just uh, keep your comments to questions only and please keep the questions polite. <laughs> yes, well, we have to remind people that. 
<laughs> I'd now like to invite uh, Councillor Robbie Sands, Mayor of Kawanyama, and performers from the New Knuckle Yuggera Aboriginal Dance Company to provide a welcome to country. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the um, Thurbul and Yuggera people, um, of the Brisbane region. I'd like to welcome everybody to the symposia today. I acknowledge um, their elders, past, present, and future, and emerging. Um, and uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge all traditional owners um, that may be in the conference today and symposia today. Um, yeah, welcome. Thank you. Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen, we are the New Knuckle Younger Aboriginal Dancers. Uh, I'd like to pay respects to our grand grandmother, uh, Aunty Kerry, who couldn't be here today. Uh, just on behalf of her, we'd like to welcome you here with the song and dance which we call Malacha. Malacha to welcome you and also the good ngoro, the good ancestor. Onani <laughs> Yagara Ngoro! Onani Yagara Malacha! Oi! people as well from the Gold Coast region. We'd like to pay respects to the ancestor from that region, which is Mibin, the Wedgetail Eagle. Next song and dance we're going to do is one which we call uh, Balkamala. Balkamala is the fishing dance. Uh, we believe that the dolphin helps us with our fishing, so we like to pay respect to the dolphin ancestor. <laughs> song with um, paying respects to Mother Earth because we believe she is the giver of everything. So this is one is Juggernaut, paying respects to Mother Earth. <laughs> <laughs>
friends. Thank you, and I um, hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Welcome. Thank you to the Nunakal Yagara Aboriginal Dance Company and a splendid way to kick off formal proceedings. I'd now like to invite Her Excellency the Honourable Dr Jeanette Young, Governor of Queensland, to provide some words of welcome. Deputy Premier, Minister for State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning. Your title is too long, you're doing too many jobs. <laughs> and Minister assisting the Premier on Olympics infrastructure, the Honourable Dr Stephen Miles, but here today because he set this up. So, and I was always so grateful that you saw the need and you did it, it was fantastic. And we have a number of members of parliament here. We of course have the Mayor of Kawanyama Aboriginal Shire Council and Chair of Torres Cape Indigenous Council Alliance. I had great delight meeting you last night, Councillor Robbie Sands. Health and Wellbeing Queensland Chair, Mr Steve Ryan, and your board members, many of whom I can see there. Uh, Chief Executive, Dr Robin Littlewood, and your team who are around, and I've met this morning, organising everything. Many, many distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you first for that delightful welcome to country. Thank you, Mayor Sands, and thank you to the Nanakul Yagara Jarjams performers. I'd like to also acknowledge the original custodians of the land that Brisbane is on, the Turrbal and Yagara people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and any First Nations people here today. Thank you. As Governor, but more importantly, as Patron of Health and Wellbeing Queensland, I'm delighted to be addressing this symposium. During my long career as a health professional, I did watch with growing concern as obesity rates developed into what I think is almost an intractable problem that we face today. We have not managed to turn the tide on obesity at a local or a global level. And as we've already heard, it affects the majority of Queensland adults. So more Queenslanders are overweight than are a healthy weight, which means a lot. Something is obviously terribly amiss. Back in 2015, as the state's chief health officer, I was amongst many who were advocating that we needed some new tools to be able to tackle the scourge of obesity in our communities. We needed to do more than simply reduce obesity rates, but that would be a good start. It needs to be done in a way that's sustainable, and we need to do it by getting communities to work it through and do it themselves. Plus, we wanted to provide leadership and inspiration for how this could happen, and we wanted Queensland to be a global leader in obesity prevention. And this vision that was developed by so many different people drove the creation of a dedicated public health agency to focus on prevention, public health and policy. With a great deal of pride and heaps of relief, I can say that my involvement, a very small role, in helping to establish Health and Wellbeing Queensland was one of the most rewarding achievements of my career. Health and Wellbeing Queensland has a very clear remit to reduce rates of obesity and therefore chronic disease and to lower health inequities in our system. By helping to find a fitter, healthier lifestyle for Queenslanders and setting up younger generations to succeed, no matter where they live in the state. That will be the success of this agency. Since its establishment, 1 July 2019, Health and Wellbeing Queensland has worked tirelessly to drive change in communities that need it most. To support First Nations communities, they're developing a remote food security strategy for far north areas in partnership with community leaders. Programs such as Deadly Choices and 10,000 Steps 
have reached more than 233,000 people in the last financial year alone, while the pick of the crop healthy eating program has reached 15,000 students. To support the health system and reduce hospitalisations, Health and Wellbeing Queensland has invested in developing a new hub model for healthcare. One such program aims at tackling high rates of type 2 diabetes in Logan, which will ultimately ease pressure on the Logan Hospital. There could not be a more exciting time to be part of improving health outcomes for Queenslanders as our state prepares to host the 2032 Olympic Games. And I firmly believe that that event presents a once in a lifetime opportunity to create a generational health shift that will benefit all of us. I'm confident with health and wellbeing Queensland leading the way, we can tide, turn that tide on obesity and create a blueprint for how it's done. Congratulations to Health and Wellbeing Queensland. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. I'd now like to invite to the stage to say a few words the Honourable Dr Stephen Miles, MP, Deputy Premier, Minister for State Development, Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning, Minister Assisting the Premier on Olympics Infrastructure and currently Acting Minister for Health and Ambulance Services. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much. Uh, Loretta, I'm uh, wondering if I could get you to come along to uh, all of my press conferences to ask the journalists to all be polite with their questions. That would be, uh, that would be most welcome. Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to use my, um, my full title. Uh, you could have just introduced me as the bloke who used to be the health minister, because uh, that's what people whisper in the supermarket when I go past them. Is, is, is that the bloke who used to be the health minister? Um, can I acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on, uh, our uh, First Nations people, uh, and particularly acknowledge the unique health challenges that their communities uh, face and our obligation to work with them to address them. Uh, I want to acknowledge all of the Indigenous health workers who are here, our Indigenous health services who are represented. Uh, Haleen, I, th I saw you here before. Uh, you're, all, you're all real deadly. Uh, Mayor Sands, uh, thanks so much for uh, uh, acknowledging country for us this morning. Uh, and I, um, uh, you know, the story of what you're doing in your community is, is inspiring for, uh, for all of us. Uh, Her Excellency, the Honourable Dr Jeanette Young, Governor of uh, Queensland, it's wonderful to be able to uh, have you here uh, at this very special event. I think this is the first time I've uh, shared a stage with the Governor since her farewell event from uh, Queensland Health, and it's fitting uh, that we are back together this week, uh, the week that the uh, health emergency finally ended. I was remembering when uh, Dr Young first asked me to sign the, the emergency declaration. Uh, we were trying to work out how under the existing law we could keep the emergency in place for more than seven days. At the time, it could only be declared for seven days. Uh, it was in place in the end for 1,006 days. Uh, long, before, uh, long before that, though, uh, the Governor, as our Chief Health Officer, uh, led Queensland's efforts to make Queenslanders healthy uh, and uh, perhaps most successfully in the area of reducing smoking. And I know uh, uh, the Governor is very, very proud of that. Uh, Governor, though, uh, Your Excellency, I am a little bit jealous. Uh, we do both have new jobs now, uh, and this week I'm the Acting Health Minister. Um, <laughs> I note that we haven't had to resort to making you the Acting Chief Health Officer. Uh, again, there's probably some constitutional reason uh, why we can't. Uh, but around that time that I joined uh, her, uh, Dr Young's team as the Health Minister in 2017, uh, a few things happened, uh, some of them personal. Uh, around that time, I had not long moved, um, moved house, uh, moved my family uh, from uh, a relatively wealthy inner city area where healthy food was common uh, to the outer suburbs, where my experience was more closely aligned with that of most Queenslanders. 
And this is probably the wrong audience for me to be making this confession. Uh, in fact, I'm certain it's the wrong uh, audience. You all probably think I'm really healthy and sophisticated. Uh, the thing I could never confess when I was the health minister was that I'm a bit partial to a burger. Uh, this reminds me a little bit of when I was the health minister and I said I wasn't that into bilbies at the World Bilby Conference. Um, but what I, what I discovered uh, in my new suburb was that when it came to burgers, we have them all. We have four McDonald's, three KFC, two Guzman and Gomez, just about every fast food you could think of. We even have Taco Bell and Carl's Jr. Uh, it's like a veritable wonderland of fat and salt and sugar. It feels like on every single corner, there is someone who will sell your children a frozen Coke for a dollar. And as health minister, I toured all of the HHSs, uh, city, country, regional, everywhere from the Gold Coast to Cape and Taurus. And to a single one, they said that they thought obesity was the greatest challenge facing their all very different communities. Not just because of the impact and cost and burden it was putting on uh, their health systems, although of course that's very real, but because of the personal hardship that it causes, because of the impact that it has on people's lives and their ability to contribute and to raise their family. And around that time, I started telling people that I realized I wasn't the Minister for Health, I was the Minister for Sick, and we should have a Minister for Health. And so I asked uh, Queensland Health, uh, in fact, I asked Yasmina, she's here somewhere, I asked Yasmina to find me uh, all of the experts, all of the smartest people in their fields, from Queensland Health, from the NGOs, uh, from the primary care sector, uh, and we had a, a fantastic meeting. Uh, but first among those experts that they brought to see me was uh, Dr. Robin Littlewood. And uh, you could tell when you met Robin and talked about uh, this topic that she was legit one of the world's best, greatest minds in the area of childhood obesity, uh, one of the world's best practitioners. But you could tell in her stories that she was sick of it. You know, she was very proud of the work that her team at the Queensland Children's Hospital had done. She brought along some of the young people that she had uh, worked with and it was very powerful for me to uh, meet them. But I think she'd come to the realization that she could work 24 hours a day, seven days a week and only ever help a few people. And that what we needed were statewide, even national responses. And so I asked the Australian government, the then Australian government, to convene with me a national obesity summit. And there I said that we had to stop blaming fat people for being fat. It was not their responsibility alone. We needed to move beyond the personal responsibility frame. Because while all of us, of course, are responsible for our day-to-day -day health decisions, when we make it about individuals, we ignore the causes. Worse still, we ignore the intentional decisions uh, made by some that lead to people being fat. Sometimes those decisions are made for profit. And when we make it about personal responsibility alone, we let governments off the hook. We let the fast food industry off the hook. We let schools and supermarkets and employers and the media off the hook. Dare I say it, we let doctors and the health system off the hook. Nobody of all of those experts brought me evidence that there were waves of people waking up and deciding they didn't want to be healthy. People don't decide to be obese. Most of the people I meet really want to be healthy and they want their families to be healthy. In so many decisions we make as a society, we don't give people many choices. In where we have them live, in the work that we have them do, in the options we give them to get between where they work and where they live, in the food we make available to them that is affordable, in what we teach them and their children. We make it really hard for people to be healthy. All of the social determinants 
of health apply equally to obesity. Poverty, poor housing, insecure and poorly paid work. You cannot tell me that the unborn babies in the research that we will release today have already decided that they want to be obese. But we can already predict with pretty good accuracy which of them will be, well before they make a single decision about what they will eat or when they will exercise. That's especially tragic for those unborn First Nations babies. We are meant to be closing the gap. That's the promise we made. And so that's why, uh, with our now governor, then the Chief Health Officer, and uh, Robin, we decided to create Health and Wellbeing Queensland. And I'm incredibly proud of what they've achieved so far and what they will go on to do from here. It's one of the things that makes me optimistic that we can prove all the research we will hear about today wrong. We have the right people, uh, dedicated and smart and passionate, and we have programs that we know can work. And we are on the pathway to hosting the two, two of the world's, the world's two biggest health and uh, wellbeing events. The, the world is coming here in 2032 to celebrate the Olympic and Paralympic Games. And we have, I think, a golden decade uh, with those hosting rights and with the work of Health and Wellbeing Queensland to change the things that make people unhealthy, to inspire them to make better individual decisions, but to also change the causes of those decisions they make uh, for their sake, for their lives, and for their li the lives of their children. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Premier and all the other people with you. <laughs> and of course, the Deputy Premier already talked about Dr. Robin Littlewood who really had the vision for today's event. So I think we should hear from her now, the Chief Executive of Health and Wellbeing Queensland, Dr. Robin Littlewood. Her Excellency, Dr. Jeanette Young, Governor of Queensland, the Honourable Dr. Stephen Miles, Deputy Premier and everything else, and I'm not going to go through that today, Loretta, you've done an amazing job of that. Um, our wonderful consumers and next generation, peers, colleagues, friends, Haleen, I need to say hello, my friend. To all First Nations friends here today, I pay my respects to you, Elders past, present and emerging, and thank you for all you have done. And to Mayor Robbie Sands, Chair of TICA, thank you for being here and mostly thank you for your relentless ongoing support of this being the most critical agenda. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men, Frederick Douglass, 1855. I have always loved that quote, but I have never appreciated it more than now. We live in a world that isn't fair. I know this because I have measured it. I have the data and so will you. Everything I'm going to share today is true, it's brand new, it's grim, and it's also very exciting. I want you all to leave today feeling the same as me, emotional and so terribly excited about that. This is the time. To be clear, I'm only revealing difficult data so that we can share the problems together, so that we can share the solutions together. Together is the key word. It's our job to do that, ours, every single one of us. Today, we are going to celebrate some pretty great people, many of you are right here, work and brilliant leadership that's right here, um, that is going on right now in this beautiful state. I couldn't feel any more pressure to get this right, neither could my team, nor could I feel more excited about our future, and neither does my team. We are laser focused. It's all about our kids. It's the next generation of Queenslanders, of leaders, of teachers, of workforces. Now for the hard part. 
Currently, the median age of death in Brisbane is 82 years, yet in some parts of the far north, it's 30 years less. At the same time, 65% of deaths among First Nations Australians occur before the age of 65 compared to 19% for everyone else. 65 compared to 19. The cost of living is hurting. A healthy diet costs more in remote communities, while at the same time, the same communities must survive on a fixed income. Put simply, food prices are high, incomes are low, leading to the highest rates of chronic disease in those areas that feel it the most with the, with the lowest access. Suicide risk increases with remoteness for both genders with a rate of 23% compared to 13.2 for Queenslanders living in major cities. Children living in remote Queensland experience higher, higher rates of developmental issues um, compared to their peers, again, living in cities. Remote communities have fewer large supermarkets, forcing residents to buy from small stores who often struggle to stock, stock shelves with limited food in their range, and basically it just costs so much more. 41% of the total diet of First, of First Nations people is made up of other food. That is, um, that is food that is very, very high in fat and, and salt. So that's nearly half of their diet. Australian children living outside of major cities are more likely to be overweight or obese at a, at a range of 29% compared to counterparts at 23%. Similar trends are seen in Queensland. Over a third of our First Nations kids, that's 37%, live with overweight and obesity, which is so much higher than the national average. For the future, we know that 90%, that is nearly all kids who are obese, go on to be obese adults. Today, that's 63,000 of our precious kids who are at risk. I'm here to tell you that the cycle stops now. Mayor Sands, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Robin. Um, our kids and their kids are the next generation. They will take our place and take up our fight, which is to continue our efforts as First Nations people to be equal to everyone else in our country, your country. I'd like to um, acknowledge the Honourable um, Janet Young, Queensland Governor, and also um, Deputy Premier Stephen Miles MP. Uh, special guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Robbie Sands. Uh, my traditional country is Kimoi. Kimoi um, is located in Cairns. So be before Cairns was given the name Cairns, the early settlers used to call it Kimoi, and that's our tribal group from my mother's side. Um, so, yeah, I, I come from the Kimoi Wallabari Yidinji clan group of the greater Yidinji nation and tribe of far north Queensland. That, and that's from my mother's side. From my father's side, I am a proud Gurugulu Kunganji of Yaraba. According to life expectancy research and, and comments already made by Dr. Robin, um, I, it's identified in the early years of the Closing the Gap strategy, my life expectancy on average is only about five or six years away from coming to an end. That's the cold hard facts of life in our remote indigenous communities and our people. I'm the, I'm the Mayor of the Kaunyam Aboriginal Shire Council. Um, be, besides our Shire area, we own two pastoral leases on Cape York Peninsula, on traditional lands of people who came who now call Kaunyama home after being sent there from the areas of the two pastoral leases that uh, we now own. Kaunyama is situated on Queensland's west, co uh, west coast of Cape York or on the eastern side of the Gulf of Carpentaria, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, we're, we're, as the crow flies, we're about 400-odd um, kilometres uh, north of Kurumba. Kaunyama... Uh, means place of many waters in the local Kogobera tribe. Um, and it was established uh, in 1908 
when the old mission of Trubanaman um, was abandoned, had to be abandoned by rising um, saltwater inundation. Um, Kaunyama Mission was set up by Anglican missionaries. Um, there are many other uh, churches that set up missions uh, on Cape York, I think. Um, the Protestants, I think, set up, and Presbyterians set up Mapun and places like that. Arakun's got it, and Mornington got a common church as well. Um, but the Anglican missionaries set up the Kaunyama Mission. From then, like many of our brothers and sisters, after the exposure of Western food, foods and processes, did our health start to de deteriorate to levels where we are now at today. We were given um, tobacco, sugar, flour and tea as rations, and alcohol. These rations, like tobacco, were forced to, forcefully given to our old people. Some of the stories my, told by my grandmother growing up in Yarraba confirms that even though some of them old women didn't want tobacco, it was forcibly given to them. But they didn't want to take it. Let's think about that for a minute. They introduced three food staples, along with alcohol and, alcohol and tobacco, that were given to our old people are the determining factors of the chronic diseases we talk about today. Tobacco is linked to cancers, chronic diseases, heart, heart diseases. Sugar and flour, high, high car, carbo, carbohydrate types of food, are linked to diabetes and heart problems, and what we're here to talk about today, which is obesity. Alcohol is the same. Tea, well, on its own and pure, it's apparently good for people's health. But sweetened, that is an additional link to the sugar in our diets. We never had sugar or refined sugar. We had native bee honey that we call sugar bag. We never had wheat, but we had native seeds like wattle seeds. Our, our people of Kaunyama, like many other Cape York people, uh, ground native seeds in Kulamans. Kaunyama naturally doesn't have rocks or rock formations um, to ground seeds. So we had to get them, we had to trade them. We had to trade goods. Indigenous people of Cape York done trading. So that myth is busted. Uh, the one about our people before colonization didn't trade or farm, etc. the basis of terra nullius. Our people down south made, made eels, eel and fish, fish farms and channels. Only now the complexity of this aquaculture technique is finally being recognized. We had Charles Darwin visit Australia. He had so many influences on our, on our indigenous society impacts. He said, we Australian Aboriginal people were the most primitive existence and were the closest man to apes and primates. Darwin informed the powers that be of the day, don't worry, the indigenous, indigenous Australians are gonna die out anyway. But hey, we still here. After 230 years of, uh, plus of uh, colonization, we have survived as one of our famous indigenous songwriters wrote and sang in his song from the late, late 1970s, we are not going anywhere. We are growing as a society compared to other Australians, and hopefully this, the latest ABS stats um, reflects my assumptions. Um, although we struggle for equity in, our, in the health space, only a few weeks ago I, as the mayor, had to contact the TCHHS um, Cairns to inform them that our people were still having to sit outside in 40 degree heat waiting to be consulted. Ken's initial response was that only a week or two before all restrictions of social dis distancing, etc., were lifted and maybe it was an oversight by the local health clinic staff. My answer to that was, it shouldn't take a phone call from me as the mayor um, to fix it. We have, we, we, during COVID, we had nurses triaging people over a loudspeaker phone with no consultation or ops being taken. Well, how does that happen? Well, it happens in Kaunyam, it happens in Cape York. But, th but this being honest with you all, um, we, we, we've had the, the Dumaji coronial inquest and the voices of concern from all other of our communities like Dumaji needs to be heard as well. 
and we talk about that equity and stuff like that. Um, we had a funeral in Kaunyama yesterday for a 21-year-old um, granddaughter of my uh, partner, um, and she died from rheumatic heart disease and other health complications. We had a suicide uh, of a 21-year-old female, um, which was very sad in, to our community, only the other day, and we were preparing for her funeral. Um, Today now, presently, our health outcomes and expectations are all centered around when or not if we and me becomes one of the new additions to our already huge number of our community with chronic diseases. This is reflected across all of our discrete indigenous communities of Queensland. Kaunyama currently don't have a kidney di dialysis unit fixed in our primary health care clinic, but the great news is that we, are, we will have a unit functioning in Kaunyama in 2023. This is so critical to our future. Kaunyama has one of the highest levels of diabetes in Queensland. Without a kidney dialysis unit in Kaunyama, many of our people would have to live in Cairns just to survive. The untold mental health impacts of our people who have to live in Cairns to survive is, is unknown. But we see our families forced to live in Cairns to survive a longing to be home with the loved ones beside them. Our older family members who live in Cairns say things to us like, we don't want to die here, we want to die on our country and be returned to country after death. We have environmental health impacts that more often than not leads to scabies and related kidney problems, rheumatic heart disease, etc. Some of the environmental health issues um, are as they were in the 1950s and 60s. Yet we have running water, we have proper sewage systems, we have waste management strategies, we have sealed roads. But for this infrastructure, like keeping our town streets well maintained, etc., we need funding to upkeep them to get the health of our people made better. Some people may say in the forum today um, that we are looking, we are, we are again looking for a handout. But where we have come from to where we are now is so similar. Remember, we are the one society in Australia that have suffered the most and will con continue to suffer. We are the most disadvantaged people of Australia. But these issues still exist today. The closing the gap strategy started off well and is well intentioned, but obviously, obviously not working. Not now that today we are learning about the emerging obesity epidemic and the impacts on younger people. In Indigenous Australians will be affected just as much. So the gap, like the Premier, Deputy Premier said, is widening instead of closing. We need functioning school tuck shops to fight the obesity problems, to provide healthy alternatives in, in the school setting. We need principals and regional office managers to make this happen. We need, to, we need the school community to be strong, to say, now that we have an operating tuck shop offering good healthy food to our kids, the school should not let the students leave the school grounds for lunch without written consent. We had, the rule, we had that rule in place before. Why can't we do that now? We need to take advantage of the run, run pick of the crop, crop programs for our kids to uh, learn to grow healthy food in the school environment. The work required, within, the work required in working with families and, and mums and bubs is engaging with our women and men for that matter, when our mums are carrying their babies for the better options that we can lead to healthier Kaunyama families and community in the long run. And that goes for all of our indigenous communities in Queensland. Some of our mums who become pregnant but have chronic disease themselves identify what support mechanisms, safety nets can be put around these families to support them. Kaunyama funded and sustained a, our own mothers and baby centre uh, and that operated for about five or six years. The funds that, that were al uh, allowed us to operate a mums and baby centre um, were generated by the council's liquor licence. Um, but then a few years ago, alcohol management plans were imposed. One of the, one of the reasons alcohol management plans were imposed is that they were saying that Indigenous Shire councils were making, the money, making money and profiteering out of the um, selling alcohol to our... Um, community, but we, we now have that gap of not providing those services to our, our mums and bubs. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, 
just wrap that up, thanks, Robin. <laughs> in, um, in closing, we, we need collective responsibility taking, through taking ownership. Strong leadership from community, elders, elected politicians, including mayors like myself. We need corporate or NGOs to invest. We need not-for-profit liquor outlets like ours in Kawanyama to fund the obligations of corporate responsibility through social, social reinvestment. There may be foundations and philanthropic donor, donors that may work in partnership with us to fund some of these things I mentioned, which are real grassroots, practical in-house, real-life benefits that we identified in our communities as possible solutions. Help us close the gap on our tracks to treaty pathways, which betterment of the health of our people is one of many of these tracks. Thanks for allowing me a small fish in a big pond to tell you a little bit of, about our plight today. Hopefully this truth-telling can assist our people's health to become better for our next generation. We, the, we as a people that are part of Australia are the most disadvantaged. That in itself must mean something. To the wider audience, why should we accept anything less? And the last comment I would like to make is please don't forget about us. Thank you. Mayor Sands, you're a very hard act to follow, but can I say I'm very, very sorry for your sorry business. And, but it's really, really nice to have you and, for you, to, and um, for you to trust us today. Okay, so now for the good part. Um, the Queensland Obesity Strategy is one of the most important pieces of work that we can, that we can do with and for families, communities and the environment. We will work with every partner every single part of government and every single community to make this happen for all Queenslanders. The Queensland equity framework will, will build on the system itself. It will build on the social conditions, barriers and enablers that already exist. Our clinical prevention strategy is bridging the gap between health promotion and clinical health care by integrating prevention across the system. We want to support our amazing clinicians, many of you in the room today, so that you can raise the topic of obesity and prevent chronic disease with confidence. The Gather and Grow Remote Food Security um, Strategy and Action Plan addresses food security for every Queenslander within this state. We want access to affordable, good quality food in every single part of Queensland, that is not difficult to ask for. Every Queenslander deserves the right to good health, no matter who they are and where they live. The only way that we will get there is through strong collaboration, strong policy, good data and evidence, research, and through listening to our communities. Equity is about ensuring that we all get what we, what we need, and that may not be the same for everyone because we all don't start from the same place. Right now, we have great, strong leadership, great relationships, talented workforces and truly passionate community leaders, just like Mayor Sands. We have great policy, big, the big four, the right work. We have a very strong social strategy developing across government. We are collecting the data, measuring and reporting on that as well. With the help of Mayor Sands, I promise you we will remain relentless in driving the prevention agenda for those who need it the most. We want this to be fair and we've already started. We want to show the world in 2032 who we are and what they can be. We are building strong children for the next generation of this beautiful state and to me that's Generation Queensland. Thank you. <laughs>